Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here this Tuesday. I feel obligated to keep telling us what day it is, just in case you don't know. It is six after the hour. The phone number here is 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. I suspect I should probably get into the call screening program here just so I can answer your phone calls. Should any of you dare call, you are allowed to. Uh, I We obviously have to get into the al-Qaeda situation. The, we haven't heard al-Qaeda in a while. We also need to get into the hydroxychloroquine situation with the president. But before we do any of that, uh, some some sad news this morning. Uh, Ravi Zacharias has passed. Let me read you some of his obituary from uh, his ministry outlet. When Ravi Zacharias was a cricket-loving boy on the streets of India, his mother called him to meet the local sari seller turned palm reader. Looking at your future, Ravi Baba, you will not travel far or very much in your life, he declared. That's what the lines on your hand tell me. There is no future for you abroad. By the time a 37-year-old Zacharias preached at the invitation of Billy Graham to the inaugural International Conference for Itinerant Evangelists in Amsterdam in 1983, he was on his way to becoming one of the foremost defenders of Christianity's intellectual credibility. A year later, he founded Ravi Zacharias International Ministries with the mission of helping the thinker believe and the believer think. In the time between the sorry seller's prediction and the founding of RZIM, Zacharias had immigrated to Canada, taken the gospel across North America, preached with military prisoners in Vietnam, and ministered to students in a Cambodia on the brink of collapse. He had also undertaken a gospel preaching trip as a newly licensed minister with the Christian and Missionary Alliance, along with his wife Margie and eldest daughter Sarah. The trip started in England, worked eastward through Europe and the Middle East, and finished on the Pacific Rim. All in all, that year, Zacharias preached nearly 600 times in over a dozen countries. It was the culmination of a remarkable transformation set in motion was Zacharias recovering in a Delhi hospital from a suicide attempt at age 17 was read the words of Jesus recorded in the Bible by the apostle John because I live you also will live in response Zacharias surrendered his life to Christ and offered up a prayer that if he emerged from the hospital he would leave no stone unturned in his pursuit of truth Once Zacharias found the truth of the gospel, his passion for sharing it burned bright until the very end. Even as he returned home from the hospital in Texas, where he had been undergoing chemotherapy, Zacharias was sharing the hope of Jesus to the three nurses who tucked him into his transport. Frederick Anthony Ravi Kumar Zacharias was born in Madras, now Chennai, in 1946, in the shadow of the resting place of the Apostle Thomas, known to the world as the Doubter. But to Zacharias is the great questioner. Zacharias' affinity for Thomas meant he was always more interested in the questioner than the question itself. His mother, Isabella, was a teacher. His father, Oscar, who was studying labor relations at the University of Nottingham in England when Zacharias was born, rose to the ranks of the Indian Civil Service throughout Zacharias' adolescence. An unremarkable student, Zacharias was more interested in cricket than books until his encounter with the gospel, gospel in that hospital bed. Nevertheless, A bold, radical faith ran in his genes. In the Indian state of Kerala, his paternal great-grandfather and grandfather produced the 20th century's first Malayalam English dictionary. The dictionary served as the cornerstone of the first Malayalam translation of the Bible. Further back, Zacharias' great-great-great-grandmother shocked her Nambuduri family, the highest caste of the Hindu priesthood, by converting to Christianity. With conversion came a new surname, Zacharias, and a new path that started her descendants on a road to Christian faith. Uh, rest in peace, Ravi Zacharias. Uh, we were actually supposed to get together. Uh, he and, and his wife wanted to take my, me and my wife to dinner, and it never worked out. And uh, we'll meet again one day. But uh, what what a what a fantastic man! Uh, smeared several years ago, smeared by someone claiming he had engaged in inappropriate relationships. No truth to the matter, but it was uh, magnified and blown up by a liberal press out to get the man. Uh, but man, uh, what a what a fantastic person! What a what a great great man uh, who led so many people to Christ. Now I did not expect to uh, start the show with that today, but my goodness. Um, I I just if you've never seen or or read uh you read the real face of atheism that is Ravi Zacharias's uh a book I see my friend Andrew Walker mentioning it this morning 
uh, Zacharias was just a, a, a wonderful human being who loved the Lord, and he will deeply, deeply, dearly be missed by a lot of us uh, who he ministered to knowingly or unknowingly over the years. Uh, just a good, good man. Now, we do need to move on to the headlines of the day, uh, and I will take your phone calls, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. The program this morning is sponsored by First Liberty Building and Loan in Noonan. Uh, If you need help getting into the PPP program, I do highly encourage you to reach out to First Liberty Building and Loan. Uh, The reason why the Frost family has been helping small and mid-sized businesses since the early 1990s, it is their specialty. They don't work directly with individuals. They work with businesses. Businesses. And if your business needs access to capital and needs to grow, they can help you. But more importantly, if your business needs to get into the PPP program, they can help you. There is still money available in the program, and First Liberty is willing to help you. What you do is you go to FirstLibertyGA.com. FirstLibertyGA.com is their website. Click on the Apply Now button, fill out your paperwork there, and they will get it processed. The one thing that the Frost family who runs First Liberty tells me is that you do need to have your uh, payroll uh, in order. Make sure that your forms are available your um, federal quarterly filings or anything legit you can prove show use to prove payroll to get into the program. And then remember, if you don't lay anybody off and maintain your payroll, uh, you will have that loan converted into a grant, uh, which is a great thing. So firstlibertyga.com is the website. Now, uh, the president's doctor has begun prescribing the president hydroxychloroquine Look, I got to be honest with you. Uh, There was a ton of media on this and a a lot of clips. And I didn't ask Charlie, uh, my producer, to to cut any of that stuff up. Uh, There was some of it that I figured it was worth playing, uh, including the president's own words. But by and large, uh, the media discussion of this is in complete outrage over the president saying anything about it and and recognizing he did it. And and some of them, and I got to be real honest with you. Part of me wonders, if I'm real honest about it, part of me wonders if the president really is actually taking hydroxychloroquine. And the reason I say it this way, and I realize this doctor has come out with a statement defending him, but it just, it sounded very much to to me that it was just the president uh, responding to the media and throwing something. And you know, he does this sometimes. He throws stuff out like this to get the media off in a direction he's learning now in the virus how to control the media response it took the president a long time to to be relearn how to steer the media in in particular directions and uh and and now i think he's figured out again with this hydroxychloroquine stuff people don't want to write the the news you know but if you look but he's the one that signed the application the very important form he signed it now if he doesn't believe in it why would he sign it? And a lot of good things have come out about the hydroxy. A lot of good things have come out. And you'd be surprised at how many people are taking it, especially the frontline workers, before you catch it. The frontline workers, many, many are taking it. I happen to be taking it. I happen to be taking it. I'm taking it. Hydroxychloroquine. Right now, yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I started taking it. Because I think it's good. I've heard a lot of good stories. And if it's not good, I'll tell you right, I'm not going to get hurt by it. It's been around for 40 years for malaria, for lupus, for other things. I take it. Frontline workers take it. A lot of doctors take it. Excuse me. A lot of doctors take it. I take it. Now, I hope to not be able to take it soon because, you know, I hope they come up with some answer. But I think people should be allowed to. I just, listen, I, I a lot of doctors say, I take it. Um, uh, listen, I, 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 I don't know whether the president's taken it or not, but the media meltdown on this, uh, there, there really was no reason for me to, to play uh, a ton of audio of people. I, there's, there's only one that I want to play. And, and this is to give you a sense of how the media is responding to this. This is CNN's treatment of the matter. President Trump is taking questions at the White House, he just mentioned that he is taking hydroxychloroquine, the medication the pr- president has promoted in the past as a potential treatment for coronavirus, though the FDA says that you shouldn't take it uh, outside of a clinical trial of the hospital, and other studies have shown it doesn't work on coronavirus. The NIH has also issued warnings about using the drug for coronavirus patients. I, I want to bring in uh, Jeremy Diamond, uh, 
uh, joining me now. Jeremy, wh wh what exactly did President Trump say? He he's, he's taking hydroxychloroquine? Uh, yeah, Jake, uh, President Trump has repeatedly touted this drug, but he just announced a moments ago for the first time that he himself has actually been taking hydroxychloroquine for the last week and a half. And the president says that he's taking it essentially as a prophylaxis to try and prevent getting the disease in the future, uh, despite the fact that there is so far no uh, sub substantive medical evidence to back up the fact that it works uh, not only as a treatment, but uh, all the more as a prophylaxis. Listen to what the president said just a few moments ago. It's been around for 40 years for malaria, for lupus, for other things. I take it. Frontline workers take it. A lot of doctors take it. Excuse me. A lot of doctors take it. I take it. And Jake, uh, just we should note there, as you were saying at the top, uh, no studies so far have shown that this is an effective treatment uh, against coronavirus. In fact, there was a pretty significant study uh, that showed that there was no effect on mortality or on the duration of a, a hospital patient's stay in the same way that we have seen uh, with the drug remdesivir. But President Trump certainly putting his money where his mouth is uh, with this. The question, though, Jake, is what effect is this going to have on the general population? Uh, you know, what are people going to think when they see that President Trump, the president of the United States, is taking this drug, despite the fact that it does not have any proven medical benefits, uh, will Americans then want to take it themselves? That certainly is a big question here, Jake. Uh, and, and again, uh, we do know that this drug has significant uh, side effects, including uh, potential heart issues for people. So uh, certainly something that could be concerning. Listen, I, it, the world is full of stupid people. We, we should acknowledge the world is full of stupid people. There's, there's nothing mean, say it is a statement of fact. Uh, truth is not mean, truth is truth. And the world is full of stupid people uh, who, just as the president said that uh, possibly we need to find ways to get uh, disinfected into people, uh, there were media stories out there that people, now admittedly, uh, media exaggerated stories about people trying to ingest Clorox and the like, but there are stupid people out there. And so I understand the media concern about the president of the United States touting hydroxychloroquine when the, when the studies are actually mixed. There are several studies out there that are small studies that show that hydroxychloroquine gives some benefit if taken early. There are other studies out there uh, that show that there is no benefit regardless of when taken. The studies are mixed. Uh, the FDA right now suggests not taking it except in clinical situations, hospital situations. You know, I've got an agent in radio and he was in the hospital and uh, they gave him hydroxychloroquine and he began to recover after they thought it was lights out for him. So he's a believer in hydroxychloroquine. And I, I know plenty of other people who are, but anecdote is not data and the data really is mixed. And it depends on who you are. It depends on when you, you get it. It depends on the dosage you get. There are all sorts of things there. And uh, it can't prevent you from getting the virus. Uh, you're better off taking a zinc supplement uh, than you are to take hydroxychloroquine if you don't want to get the virus. And, and the, the by the way, the research on zinc is dubious as well, except it does appear to present as a milder case when you get viruses like the cold or the flu. If you've got zinc in your system because of the way it, it impacts the virus absorption into cells. But here's the thing, y'all. There, there's no reason to dwell on this for a very long time. This is just the bottom line. For years, we have been told not to get between a woman and her doctor's decision to murder a baby. Who am I to get between a man and his doctor's decision to take a pill? If I, I can't get between the one, why should any of us be allowed to get between the other? Two books by Ravi Zacharias uh, that I recommend if you've never read, uh, Jesus Among Other Gods and The Real Face of Atheism. And both of them are really good books if you want a basic understanding of, of his ministry to, to atheists uh, and people in the East. He was a, just a, a brilliant evangelist. Uh, now, a, a, a few more things on the president's hydroxychloroquine situation. I... I, I the media, you know, the president, I think, has finally figured it out. One of the, the remarkable things about the president's uh, inability, his superpower has always been, uh, well, he's got two superpowers, this president. And, I, yeah, they are super, they are remarkable abilities of this president. One is the ability to make other people reveal themselves to be as bad as they claim the president is. They meditate on that one for a moment. There are so many people who believe the president is, uh, you, you know, there's, there's no reason to even delve into it. They, they, all of the things they claim the president is. 
And the president has this unique superpower to make other people behave in whatever way they claim he behaves. The president has the superpower. It, it, it makes other people act in ways they claim the president acts. The other superpower that this president has or had is the ability to steer the national conversation in particular directions. And when this virus reared its head domestically, the president could not. I mean, think about all the news cycles we had last year. I mean, all the way up to killing Qasim Soleimani, all all of the in beginning this year with the Iran situation, uh, we had all of these situations. And every week there was a new one. Every week it changed. Every week it, uh, it every week it shifted. And then the virus reared its head at the end of January, and it has been wall to wall nonstop virus, even overshadowing ultimately at the end impeachment. Which, by the way, impeachment was another news cycle and just gone. We've been in this nonstop news cycle about the uh, about the COVID nineteen since really mid February and really in March, and it hasn't shifted. It seems like every day that's all we can talk about. And I've been struggling trying to find other things to talk about. And the president has had this unique gift. Uh, sometimes he used it badly, uh, where he could send the media off and wrap in, in all sorts of directions. If you will recall, two years ago at the State of the Union address, he did it again last year, but it was really two years ago where it was most powerful. The president had a family in the gallery at the State of the Union, and he began a, a lengthy dissertation on the ills of MS-13, the gang. And... The media was forced finally to recognize that it was a real problem. And the president actually, there was merit to his argument. And there were areas of this country where the gang was infiltrating and local authorities seemed helpless to the gang. And yep, there were issues where we needed to uh, crack down on immigration. The president delivered that, I want to say, on a Monday night, maybe a Tuesday night, and by Thursday went on a media attack, went went on a Twitter tirade and attack against someone in the media, and I can't remember who it was at the time. But the media had spent the entire week talking about MS-13, and they were going to, the Sunday shows were going to continue coverage of the President's State of the Union address because it had become such a big issue. The president had done a good job. The Democrats were on defense, and the president went on this Twitter tirade against someone in the media, and by Sunday it was all gone. Now, states of the union are largely meaningless anyway, and they always go away despite, you know, this was one of my frustrations when I was in the media, when I was on TV and on CNN. Uh, You would gear up uh, all this coverage of uh, whatever it was, you'd gear up this this massive coverage of the State of the Union, and you would all go to New York or Washington, you would all be on a set, you'd have 20 people on CNN discussing the State of the Union. And uh, by three, th- within a, a week, we had all moved on everywhere. Oh, this is monumental, this is going to change the course of the president, this is going to change the course of everything. And then by the end of the week, uh, you moved on to something else. And, and this president has stepped on himself repeatedly. But he has this unique superpower where he can redirect the media's trajectory in, in the stories they cover and how they cover them and what they're covering. And he has always been able to use that to his advantage when he uses it wisely. Uh, but of late, he's been unable to do that. Of late, the media has just fixated on uh, the virus. They haven't shifted to other stories. And I, I, my my gut feeling is that the president is not actually on hydroxychloroquine. He has just finally realized he can direct the media narrative in directions he wants to go. And proof of it is when I, I – so I use a service that cuts up media audio clips. And like the top 10 clips were all about last night and the president talking about hydroxychloroquine. And I don't know that the story actually helps the president. I I don't know that it actually does. But the fact that he is relearning how to direct the media's coverage of things, I think is going to be a useful skill moving forward. The the Obamagate situation, another one. How many, uh, you've got Margaret Sullivan at at the Washington Post, right? We're going to turn this into Hillary's servers. Please, media, don't go down this road. It only helps Trump. Yes, you're right. It does help Trump. 
And yes, you're right. The media is going to go down that road. Why? Because the president has refigured out how to get the media to go in directions he wants. And that's going to help him and hurt Joe Biden in the run up to the campaign. I found it. I found it. It's worth reading. Uh, here, here, Margaret Sullivan. The media is helping Trump turn the bogus Obama gate into the 2020 version of Clinton's emails. It's becoming clear that journalists never fully reckoned with the mistakes of the 2016 campaign coverage. We know this because Donald Trump got elected. She she doesn't write that, but that's what she means. We know this because they seem poised to repeat them. As you may recall, the news media from Fox News to the New York Times and plenty of others across the political spectrum managed to make the relative molehill of Hillary Clinton's dicey email practices into a daily obsession, roughly equal to the mountain of Donald Trump's financial and personal transgressions. Well, don't look now, but this is happening again before our eyes. Its name this time is Obamagate. That's a moniker that, in President Trump's outrage tweets, is rendered in capital letters. But let's not. This vaporous, apparently made-up offense, according to Trump, is the political crime of the century, and heck, last century too, because he claims that it makes the 1970s Watergate scandal look like child's play. As best as he's ever attempted, even attempted to spell out, it supposedly involves a deep state conspiracy by the former president and his allies to undermine Trump by being informed of the identity of the private citizen having covert and legally questionable discussions with the Russian ambassador, a citizen who turns out to be Trump's national security advisor designate Michael Flynn. Despite the fact that this practice is legal and normal, the non-scandal around it is getting plenty of attention. On Chris Wallace's Sunday morning interview show, usually an island of relative sanity in the hyperpartisan pro-Trump world of Fox News, a bottom-of-the-screen cry on red, is Obamagate an effective campaign strategy? And Trump water carrier Karl Rove was allowed to opine that there were some very serious questions that need to be answered. It does stink. Juan Williams, the network's designated left-leaning contrarian, tried to pour water on the nonsense. There is no Obamagate, he said bluntly, declaring Trump's blather a smokescreen to distract from his disastrous handling of the coronavirus pandemic. Still, the conversation about the non-scandal went on for about seven minutes on this popular show at the nation's most-watched cable network. Nor was it ignored on Meet the Press where host Chuck Todd, while acknowledging the subject's ultimate emptiness, kicked around its potential political fallout for a while with White House correspondent Peter Alexander and others. And at CBS News, Catherine Herridge has been heavily hyping her updates on the non-story scoop, she declared on Twitter, to herald her story that acting director of national intelligence Richard Grinnell had notified Congress about the great unmasking. CBS's hiring of Herridge from Fox News last year was sharply criticized by liberals who recalled her persistent reporting on the Clinton email debacle and on debunked allegations that the former Secretary of State personally approved the diminishment of security at the Benghazi compound in Libya before the 2012 attack there. So let's just say that Obamagate is getting plenty of attention across the media spectrum, even if it's filtered through the lens of whether it will matter to swing state voters. But it does. So th- this is this is the, the ridiculous thing here. With, with Marcus Sullivan Peace, and you're hearing more of this in the media, is that please don't talk about this thing that we don't like. But when the president of the United States starts talking about it, it's kind of hard to ignore it. Can we not agree on that? I mean, when the president of the United States is out there constantly doing this, the media has a hard time avoiding it. I mean, the the media itself would look irresponsible if the president is talking about this. They don't even, even if they're doing it to dismiss it. And that's her point. She doesn't want him to talk about it at all. And by the way, it, it, will it have an impact on swing savers? I actually don't think it will. I actually don't think the Obamagate stuff uh, matters to most people. In the same way, Hillary Clinton's email situation did not matter to most people. There were not a bunch of swing voters out there who said, you know what? I'm not going to vote for Hillary Clinton because of her incompetence on email or on Benghazi, frankly. Swing voters didn't vote for Hillary Clinton because they genuinely didn't like her in general. I mean, that's the thing I think a lot of Republicans miss. Listen, 
just because you hated Hillary Clinton and thought the email scandal was proof that she thought she was above the law doesn't mean that a bunch of swing voters who hated Hillary Clinton also voted against her for that. No, they, they voted against her because uh, they, they didn't like her. They never liked her. And she was a terrible campaigner, and she didn't go to swing states that she needed to go to. It had nothing to do with the email server of Benghazi. And you see, you know, in the echo chamber of the right, where I live, people get spun up on this sort of stuff, and it doesn't really matter. You think it matters because you and all of your right-leaning friends all talk about it as if it matters. But you were never going to vote for Hillary Clinton anyway. In the same way... On the left, hydroxychloroquine doesn't matter. On the left right now, they're spun up about hydroxychloroquine and the president taking hydroxychloroquine and the president shouldn't take hydroxychloroquine and he's going to make stupid people take hydroxychloroquine. And people on the left, this is a grave concern to them. They deeply care about this issue, but no swing voter cares about the president and his doctor. I mean, again, after all, For years, we've been told you can't come between a woman and her doctor's decision to murder a child. You can't come between a man and his doctor's decision to take a pill. You just can't. And swing voters couldn't care less. You've got to be able to navigate through the echo chamber to what actually is reality. And on on the right, you're convinced that Obamagate matters. It doesn't. On the left, you're convinced hydroxychloroquine matters. It doesn't. What matters is swing voters. And right now, what matters to swing voters is the virus and the economic recovery. And if the president can move us beyond the virus to economic recovery, that matters, which is why so many people on the left are just adamantly convinced that the president should not be allowed to do this, that the president should not be allowed to reopen the country. By the way, there's a phenomenon. I wrote about this this morning. And I, I, this is this is important. Um, the the president of the United States this morning, I, I, I'm sorry, uh, not the president of the United States. I, I wrote about this this morning with the president and everything else that that's going on out there. The president of the United States and and governors in the South are invested in the idea of reopening the government. Brian Kemp yesterday had a call with the president where the president of the United States uh, commended him on reopening. And this comes on the heels of the president. Remember, where, where's the I, I save the audio just so we can hear it one more time. I told the governor of Georgia, Brian Kemp, that I disagree strongly with his decision to open certain facilities which are in violation of the phase one guidelines for the incredible people of Georgia. They're incredible people. I love those people. They are, they're great. They've been strong, resolute. But at the same time, he must do what he thinks is right. I want him to do what he thinks is right. Uh, but I disagree with him on what he's doing. But I want to let the governors do. Now, if I see something totally egregious, totally out of line, I'll do. But I think spas and beauty salons and tattoo parlors and barber shops in uh, phase one, we're going to have phase two very soon, is just too soon. I think it's too soon. That was what the president said then. And now he is commending Governor Kemp for reopening. And you know what's happening? When this virus first started, if if you're a regular listener to this program, back in January and February, I was telling people that you needed to go on and stock up. Take this seriously. That maybe it wouldn't come here, but if it did come here, it was going to be problematic, and uh, you needed to take care. You needed to stock up. Uh, You know, it's it's one reason. So Mrs. Griffin's uh, Barbecue Sauce sponsors the program, and I'm glad to have them be a sponsor. They're a barbecue sauce. You you know, you still go to the grocery store. Like I go to Publix, and and you have a hard time finding ketchup and mayonnaise. You can find Mrs. Griffin's Barbecue Sauce because it's local and it's delicious. Now, I will tell you, yesterday I made my homemade barbecue sauce that I rarely ever make these days, and it's fantastic. But if I didn't have it, I would be using Mrs. Griffin's, and you should too. 
I made pulled pork yesterday, and I've been wanting it. I call it my brisket sauce. I normally only make it for brisket, but it's really good. I put the. You should follow me on Instagram at E W Erickson on Instagram, and you can see my recipe. Some of you won't like it, but it's not a vinegar. It's not really even mustard. It, it you'll you'll it's it's a sweet citrusy sauce, and then you put cayenne in and it gets spicy in, in any of it. Thank you to Mrs. Griffins for your sponsorship as well. An excellent barbecue sauce that you can get at the grocery store, and it's stocked on the shelves at the grocery store, unlike so many other products. Why? Because they're local here in Georgia. They're a local business, and they're stocking the shelves themselves. Tell about the grocery stores. And the governor wants to to, to reopen the economy now here in Georgia and start letting people get back out of their house and resume their lives and let the toilet paper flow back onto the shelves of the grocery stores, and the president is now committing him, and there's this thing happening. There are truthers on the left that have come out. The truthers on the left now believe that Brian Kemp is lying about the data. Over the weekend in Atlanta, there was a spike of 231 COVID-19 cases that disappeared. Where did it go? The left became convinced that Brian Kemp is lying about the data. Nope. Here's what happens. The state has now begun testing some people who thought they had COVID-19 but never got tested originally. So they no longer have it, and they're being given the antibody test. The antibody test may or may not be accurate, uh, but it returned positives, and the, the testing facility that logged the data put it in the wrong column. They put it in the column of test positive COVID-19 as opposed to antibody test positive. And those are different things because the, we're still sorting out whether or not the antibody test is actually accurate and the people who have it actually don't currently have it. So they're only in, in the positive test. They're only putting in people who test positive for uh, coronavirus right now. And so when they realized the mistake, they took those 231 uh, number, that 231 case out and it dropped the number. And the less a conspiracy. Brian Kemp's rigging the numbers to make it look better than it is. It's really worse than this by 231. In Florida, the same thing happened. The the, the, the woman in charge of uh, the data in Florida has been reassigned. She created a website that healthcare professionals around the nation have loved. The, the Dr. Burks of the White House has praised the design of the state of Florida website. There's only a problem. It kept breaking and the data kept screwing up. And so the woman developed this website. Everyone praised it, but it kept screwing up. So they've reassigned her. So the media is now doing the story. Let, let me let me cover the story for you. This, this is crazy. Uh, Florida Today has the story. As Florida reopens, COVID-19 data chief gets sidelined and researchers cry foul. Late last Friday, the architect and manager of Florida's COVID-19 dashboard, praised by the White House officials for its accessibility, announced she had been removed from her post causing outcry from independent researchers now worried about government censorship. The dashboard had been a one-stop shop for researchers, the media, and the public to access and download tables of COVID-19 cases, testing, and death data to analyze freely. It's been widely hailed as a shining example of transparency and accessibility. But over the last few weeks, it has crashed and gone offline. Data has gone missing without explanation, and access to the underlying data sheets has become increasingly difficult. So last week, the woman who set it up was removed after the problem started. And so now researchers all on the left are crying foul. Let me read you buried at the bottom of this story. There is one key sentence. One key sentence buried, it's not even at the bottom, it's it's buried in, the, in about three quarters of the way down. Data access, since she was fired or reassigned, data access has not worsened further yet, but researchers are sounding the alarm. So the timeline, woman creates website, website is highly praised, website begins breaking all the time, data goes missing, she gets reassigned after all of this starts happening, the data access hasn't worsened since she left, and now the, everyone else is like, oh, the Florida must be engaged in conspiracy. They, notice that the media is, is fundamentally, they were fundamentally invested, along with a lot of conservatives, myself included, on pushing back on conservatives who said the, the, the data was wrong. There were so many conservatives who were lying about that. It's just the flu. How many times have you heard it's just the flu? I'm sorry. Has the flu killed 80,000 people in 10 weeks ever? No. 
And so uh, there are those of you out there yelling at me right now. But, 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 but the data is all wrong. There are, how, how many deaths are, are fraudulent? No one can give me an answer on this. How, how many of the 85,000 people who have died are wrong? How many shouldn't have been on the list? No one can provide. Is it 40,000? Well, if it's 40,000, you know what? That leaves 45,000 people who've died in 10 weeks of this virus, which still makes it worse than the flu. Nobody can give me the accurate data. I can give you the data. I just can't make you believe it. But the right engaged in these conspiracy theories, people on the right, myself included, push back on it. Well, now the left is, is creating these conspiracy theories that Brian Kemp and Ron DeSantis are rigging the data as they reopen the states. They're downplaying the data. They're, they're changing the data. And you know what? what's so frustrating about it is that members of the media who are willing to push back on conservatives aren't willing to do it on the left because many in the media actually agree. Many people in the media actually believe that Brian Kemp and Ron DeSantis are painting rosy scenarios and they can't admit it because there's no evidence of it, but they believe it, so they're not willing to push back on the left. If you're not willing to push back on left-wing data truthers like you were right-wing data truthers, you're not an intellectually honest person. You've got to be willing to push back on that, but they're not. So it's left up to to people like me, and and it's really frustrating. For two months, I and a bunch of others were pushing back on right-wing data truthers who were lying about the data, claiming it was fraudulent, claiming it was fake, claiming it was exaggerated, and now the left is doing the same, that the data is fraudulent, the data is fake, the data is exaggerated, and it's not. The data is the data. I can lead you to it. I can't make you take it. But the media that was so invested in pushing back on people on the right isn't willing to invest in people pushing back on the left. Part of that is members of the media really do believe the virus is going to rebound and a reopening is dangerous. But part of it and a growing part of it is that so many members of the media have institutionally invested in the idea that Brian, or that Donald Trump is bad, Brian Kemp is bad, Ron DeSantis is bad, and they all need to be beat, that they can't afford to give them any credit. And they can't afford to allow them to reopen their states because if their states reopen and the economy rebounds, that's going to help the president. And above all else, the media views the president as more dangerous than the virus, that he must be stopped more than the virus. And if the president must be stopped more than the virus, then the president can't be given any credit for an economic rebound. And the best way to stop the president for getting any credit for an economic rebound is to keep you sheltered in place by ignoring the good news and focusing on the bad news. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. My mom texts me that I need to slow down, so I will slow down. (laughs) Sometimes I get excited. The news is very excitable these days. Joe Biden. Oh my goodness. They, 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 this is the, (laughs) this plays into the president's hands. Joe Biden on Tuesday released a three page summary of his medical history in which his doctors declared he is a healthy, vigorous 77 year old, fully capable of taking on the role of president. Biden, who has taken to challenging voters and reporters to push up contests and wrestling matches to demonstrate his physical vigor, has faced persistent questions during the campaign about his age and his mental acuity, most prominently from President Trump. The summary indicates that Biden has been treated for several conditions, including an irregular heartbeat, gastroesophageal reflux, and seasonal allergies. It was written by Kevin O'Connor who is director of executive medicine at the George Washington Medical Faculty Associates and was Biden's physician when he was vice president. Wait, 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 wait. Where is it? Where is it? Uh, Where where is it? Where is it? Hang on. It appears that they did not test his cognitive functions. The only test, this is Olshansky, who is Olshansky, Stuart Olshansky, a professor of public health at the University of Illinois, Chicago, who analyzes the longevity, longevity, not longitudinal, longevity of president, said that Biden's workout regime was a positive sign. The most important thing that I saw on there, once you get into your 70s, the one signal that is the strongest of all that tells you someone is exceptional is their ability to work out on a regular basis, working out at least five days a week for someone his age, if that's indeed true, is remarkable. 
The only test that hasn't been done is the cognitive functioning test, Olshansky added. But the fact that he's on the campaign trail and meeting a rigorous travel and meeting schedule probably would suffice as a replacement for the formal test for cognitive function. He said the cognitive tests are typically not required unless problems are detected. Have you not paid attention to Biden on the campaign trail? (laughs) Have you not paid attention to this man? He doesn't know where he is. I mean, you tell Biden he's on the campaign trail and he asks, is it the traditional with Worcestershire or is it the one with the M&Ms? Not trail mixer, campaign trail. Oh, Biden has no idea. I mean, the man does not know. Listen, say what you, uh, Joe Biden, very nice guy, not trying to be insulting here, but good gracious, the Joe Biden of 2020 is not the Joe Biden of 2016. The Donald Trump of 2020 is the exact same Donald Trump that existed four years ago. The Joe Biden of today is not the Joe Biden of four years ago, and only the Democrats try not to pay attention to that. Uh, Joe Biden being on the campaign trail is not a test of his cognitive function because he doesn't even know he's on the campaign trail in order to be able to test it. Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. At the bottom of the hour, Byron York is going to join me from the Washington Examiner. So you're going to want to stick around for that. The phone number, if you want to be a part of the program, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. The program sponsored by First Liberty Building and Loan in Noonan, Georgia. If you are a small business that needs access to the payroll protection program, be sure to go to firstlibertyga.com. You can apply. Apply for PPP on their website. Uh, Get your payroll in order. uh, Get your proof of payroll in order for the paperwork verification, and you'll be able to get into the program. Uh, There's money available. They can't guarantee it. I I do need to say that they can't guarantee you get access to the program, but they'll do their best, and they've had a great track record being able to get people in. Uh, First Liberty Building and Loan in Noonan, they're, they're a small lender. And they specialize in helping small businesses, mid-sized businesses. They've been doing so since 1993. Uh, it is their passion, and they want to help you. Thank you to them for sponsoring the program. FirstLibertyGA.com is their website. If you need access to payroll protection, uh, you need to give them a call stat uh, before the money in the program runs out. Because who knows when Congress is going to pass this next bill. It's ridiculous, and we will get there. But uh, can we take a distraction from politics, a, a meandering road away? we got Byron York at the bottom of the hour, so we'll get pulled back into it. But Mel Gibson has a new movie coming out. I woke up this morning and Mel Gibson was a trending topic on social media. And I thought, oh, Lord, what happened? Um, And, well, what happened is the outrage mob decided to go after him. Uh, Mel Gibson has a new movie. It is called Force of Nature. And in it, uh, Mel Gibson is living in Puerto Rico. Uh, and refuses to leave uh, his condo in Puerto Rico as Hurricane Maria is approaching. You remember Hurricane Maria uh, really devastated the island. He's refusing to leave, and uh, Hispanic drug lords uh, raid the building, and, and he's got a he and Kate Bosworth have to fight them off. Uh, and uh, let me just read you some of the tweets. The outright disrespectful, it's, uh, no, I'm sorry, I misread that. It's outright disrespectful to the people who went through the traumatic experience that was Hurricane Maria for Mel Gibson and any Hollywood company to come to Puerto, R- Puerto Rico and make a movie where the islanders are the bad guys and he and the white people are the good guys. Ha uh-huh. Mel Gibson is starring in a movie where he refuses to evacuate his home in Puerto Rico. That's about to be hit by a Category 5 hurricane. Where is the causacity? Whose idea was this? Americans, Mel Gibson to play a Puerto Rican resident. Unacceptable. The people of Puerto Rico do not deserve this. Um, um, the trauma of my people... As the perfect setting for the next Hollywood people, the gringos do not support or contribute to Puerto Rico, but they want this movie. 
Oh my goodness gracious! Uh, and, and, and people are are people are uh, a, a traumatic hurricane that brutally affected it's it's affected not affected uh, Puerto Rico and continues to this day is being made into a movie and it's about a white man and that white man is the racist Mel Gibson. You can't make this up. Why is racist anti-Semitic Mel Gibson killing Hispanic people on Puerto Rico in a movie? Uh, ha, 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 ha. uh wow um wow the, okay hang on one more one more one of the most tone deaf things i've seen from hollywood in a while two white people stranded in puerto rico during the hurricane fight criminals you think it's easier to have empathy for people of color than the mental acrobats needed acrobatics needed to just y'all come on you know, the, the worst thing about social media is it allows the outrage mobs to connect with each other and grow the mob. This is this is craziness. Um, it, people have been whipped into frenzies. It's like, for example, people are outraged at what's her name? Kelly Ripa. Kelly Ripa has been doing her live with Kelly and whoever the sidekick is for several weeks now from for, for a couple of months now from home. And she's largely just abandoned, worrying about getting her hair done. You can see gray roots and stuff. And people have been shaming her for doing that. So she got on and basically said, how dare you people? I'm trying to do this show all the time. I'm not going out. I'm not violating quarantine. I'm, I'm getting my daughter to do my hair. How dare you criticize me? Now she's getting lit on fire on social media for telling people not to criticize her. You can't win with the outrage mob. Uh, the only way to win with the outrage mob is to ignore the outrage mob. Uh, and the outrage mob will eventually move on to other people. It, it really is just absolutely silly. Uh, and and now they're going after Mel Gibson. They will never allow Mel Gibson to repent uh, of, of prior behavior and sins. Here's the thing. Uh, people in Hollywood love Mel Gibson. People in Hollywood want to work with Mel Gibson. People in Hollywood appreciate Mel Gibson, but they've been scared to be near Mel Gibson uh, be, because of prior antics and behaviors. He did have some issues, admittedly, uh, caught on on tape doing bad things, but has largely tried to heal himself, and the outrage mob doesn't want to let him go. This is something that – this, by the way – there's a larger aspect to this, uh, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm going to go on a riff here. We'll get back to politics here in just a little bit. This is important, though, because, because this plays into politics. What you find increasingly in society these days is a group of people who have no grace. Now, I mentioned before the C.S. Lewis line, the thing that sets Christianity apart from every other religion, including secularism, is that it has a concept of grace. Uh, God gives you the things you do not deserve. Mercy, every every religion has mercy. Mercy is, is your God spares you from the things you deserve. But Christianity has, has uh, given you the things you do not deserve. And... We should recognize that. And what secularism does not have is grace. And and they don't have forgiveness. There is no concept of forgiveness unless you completely conform. So, for example, I am an evangelical Christian, uh, white male, almost to my mid-40s, with two kids who go to a Christian private school. Uh, We believe in biblical inerrancy. We believe that homosexuality is a sin and marriage is between a man and a woman. Those are my beliefs. That is anathema to most of culture these days. In fact, I can tell you I've had more than one person tell me I will never be able to grow this radio show to a national success, which which I want to do. I, I, I want this program to be a national program. I, I don't want it to be just a Georgia program. I want over time for it to grow into something national. I, I, I've made no bones about that. Uh, I, I want to be a, a nationally syndicated radio show host. I see so many people who have become nationally syndicated radio show hosts who, frankly, I think just throw red meat at the crowd and, and tell you what they think you want to hear as opposed to what they actually believe. And I'm perfectly willing to tell you what I believe, and you can disagree with me, and we can still be friends or not. I, I get angry email all the time from people who are upset that I, I dare to challenge something that they believe, even though we're on the same side of the aisle. But I'm not willing to abandon my convictions, and I, I weave those convictions into this program. I, I do a, a show on Good Friday, whether you like it or not, whether, whether the program directors of America like it or not. I do a show about Easter on Good Friday. And there are plenty of people, oh, well, what, when you get big, you're going to have to give this up. I, I have no plans to do that. 
there are people who believe uh, unless you conform to culture, you can't access culture. You're not allowed to access culture. Look at, take for example, remember Lauren Daigle. Uh, Lauren Daigle is a brilliant singer. And Lauren Daigle started out in, in Christian music. And she had some crossover success into pop music. And Billboard asked her her views on homosexuality, completely not relevant to a music interview. But, of course, Billboard is a secular outlet, and Lauren Daigle is an evangelical Christian, and they asked her, and she said she didn't know. She wasn't sure. Well, Christians lit her on fire for not having biblical clarity at a moment where she was trying to break over and into, into success, showed her no grace in the matter or understanding and the left lit her on fire because she, she didn't say uh, she disagrees with her faith, just that she didn't know all sides lit her on fire. And, and, and she's largely stepped away from the spotlight. She's got a new album out, but it hasn't been nearly as successful. Hasn't been nearly as successful. She's gun shy of doing press interviews. People later alive. You see this all the time. If Mel Gibson were to, you know, Mel Gibson, here's the dirty little secret. Mel Gibson is center, right? Like Clint Eastwood. And you notice how uh, the, everyone does their best to ignore Clint Eastwood these days, except on Fox. Ever since Clint Eastwood uh, had that empty chair on stage at the Republican convention for Mitt Romney, uh, the, the, people have been outraged by him. And the same with Mel Gibson. It came out that Mel Gibson might be kind of center right and he's a devout Catholic. <gasps> Get her. And yes, and Mel Gibson has done other things. Mel Gibson has, has gone on tirades about Jews before. Yeah, he has. Totally inappropriate stuff, and they called him out, and he had to apologize for it. Uh, at, at one point, he, I believe he had a, a chemical dependency, raging alcoholism or something, and he was a mean drunk. And had to deal with that. And people in Hollywood l- would like to revitalize Mel Gibson because they enjoy working with Mel Gibson, but the outrage mob won't let him. Now, if Mel Gibson were to come out tomorrow and announced he was very sorry for all of his problems. He realizes what he was struggling with was his gender, and he really is non-conforming, and for years he was fighting it, and he's sorry, and and this whole Christianity thing is a bunch of hooey, and really there is no God uh, except us, and we are made in our own image, and therefore I want to be made on on the image that makes me feel most comfortable. He would be a overnight box office sensation for the love. He would never be able to actually have a good box office movie again. Nobody would want to go see that except Hollywood. But they the, the the outrage mob would welcome him back with open arms. He would write a big check to some gay rights advocacy group, and and the left would g- welcome him back with open arms. But if he's going to, if he apologizes for the anti-Semitic statements he's made in the past, and apologizes for his treatment of other people in the past, and, and makes amends and says he's gotten treatment, but he still believes in God and Christianity, and he still has a center right worldview, well, to heck with him. Now you take that, Mel Gibson. And you layer it on top of wokeness and outrage culture where he's a white dude in Puerto Rico fighting uh, Hispanic drug lords. And by the way, if you see the preview, yeah, the the drug lords are Hispanic. And here he is with Kate Bosworth in Puerto Rico. And oh, my goodness, racism, racism. It all compiles its way together. You know, increasingly, the, these formula, formulas on the left for for checkbox wokeism when it comes to movies, they don't actually sell well, but it allows people on the left to feel good about themselves. You know, I, I had to give up on so much of the of the the WB stuff, the CW stuff, the the DC TV series stuff. It's just, I mean, you you've got to have and, and listen. I, I this is not the sort of stuff that that turns me off. I don't care that there's a, a gay person in a movie. I don't care that there's a a gender non-binary person in a show. I really don't. But the fact that in the the DC comic books, you've got to have you you have to have your your uh, white male lesbian, your your black female lesbian, your your white female lesbian, your black female lesbian, your white gay guy, your not gender non-binary, non-conforming, don't uh, judge me person, your white guy who must learn from the, the woke crowd. I mean, it, it, the formula has become just so obnoxiously woke. It, I don't care about it being part of the show. I don't care about these characters' backgrounds. I don't care who anybody's sleeping with in a DC comic show. You're there to fight the bad guys. But the fact that it has become the, the formulaic wokeness of the of the stuff uh, and that Hollywood believes this is a, largely, by the way, this is indoctrination. Have you ever seen the Disney shows? My kids on their own decided they wanted to stop watching the Disney stuff on the Disney channel, the, the, the live action stuff, because it was so 
in your face, um, gender not the boys who were just as likely to put on the makeup as the girls. And, and my kids were like, that just doesn't seem right. I mean, Hollywood just wants to have left wing culture as a tool of indoctrination. And you see this on the CW shows. You see this on the Disney Channel shows and the left loves it. And, and by the way, it, it doesn't perform very well. By and large. Now, the DC stuff performed well for a while when, when they got out of the formulaic check your box wokeness, the identity politics stuff. When there was just a gay character who was gay, nobody cared. But when you, you had to, to, to it, was, it was how the person was defined as opposed to what they did, uh, and that became the big thing. Then suddenly people were like, ah, I, I actually want to, I'm here for the action, not for the wokeness. And they tuned out. But the woke mob demands that you be there not for the, the action and not for the plot, but for the wokeness. And nobody wants to see that. So here comes Mel Gibson, who is already problematic on the left because he's not woke enough and he's got past problems for which he's apologized, but they can't forgive him because he did not abandon his long-held beliefs of, of faith and, and uh, traditional conservatism to, to become woke. He just apologized for being a jerk, among other things, that they can't actually forgive him because unless you repent and abandon conservatism, you're, you're not actually honest in your apology. He comes out and he's got this movie and they're going to let, they haven't even seen it. They, it. It reminds me very much of conservatives who are upset with that stupid movie about the hunt where you didn't, all you saw was the plot. It looked like, oh, uh, rich white people are hunting poor Trump voters. This is going to be bad. And, and the right shamed them into putting the movie out. And it turns out actually that was nothing, nothing about the plot. It was completely misrepresented. People based it all on the trailer and they were all wrong and people will be wrong about this. But what they're really worried about is that this movie might actually be a box office success. If it's a box office success. Well, then there might be a more of a crowd for Mel Gibson movies and movies like this and, and just uh, cop movies. Who cares about the wokeness? You've got to care about the wokeness. The woke mob forces you to care about wokeness. And if you don't, you're a bad person. Most people don't care about it, though. Most people couldn't care less about it. And so the outrage mob must be ever more vocal to silence those who point out that nobody really cares about this stuff. Nobody wants to watch this stuff. People just want to go be entertained. They don't want to be preached to and indoctrinated. Well, you're not allowed to say that even if you believe it because wokeness won't abide by that. And so the outrage mob has come again for Mel Gibson for Derry to just put out a movie and they wanted permission. They, they wanted him to realize this is bad. It's not really bad. It's a Mel Gibson movie. Either you're going to like it or you're not going to. You don't have to go watch the movie. But then they don't want you to watch the movie either. I got to read you guys the story. Welcome back. The phone number is 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Uh, this is from the Babylon Bee. I, I saw this and just died laughing. Headline. <laughs> Joel Osteen warns. It is far too soon to reopen the Bible. Prosperity gospel preacher Joel Osteen has warned the nation it is far too soon for Christians to reopen their Bibles. We must continue our indefinite lockdown of the Bible, he said in a sermon Sunday. If we open it up too soon, it could be a disaster. Just think, if people started reading their Bibles willy-nilly, they wouldn't believe what I have to say any longer, and my luxury cars aren't going to pay for themselves. Out of an abundance of caution, it's important we keep our Bibles closed as long as possible. Studies have shown that reopening the Bible can lead to sudden heart change, reduced fear and anxiety, and the destruction of every tenet of the prosperity gospel. Osteen says these F effects are detrimental to Christians who simply want God to bring blessing, favor, and lots of cold, hard cash into their lives. We simply can't reopen God's word anytime soon. Osteen then declared words of victory over himself and his congregation for the next 20 minutes to get the taste of the word Bible out of his mouth. <laughs> I love the Babylon Bee. Um, it, 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 <laughs> it is well done. Uh, hey, let, let's see. Hang on. Uh, if you've never been to the Babylon, the website is babylonb.com. Um, let's see. Uh, here we go. <laughs> yes. Um, 
Mayor Bill de Blasio has a stern warning for beachgoers in the city of New York today. You will literally get blown up. The mayor proudly announced that he had the New York Police Department install a state-of-the-art naval minefield surrounding the city so that anyone who swims in the water will get flung sky high. To make sure as many people stay alive as possible, we're going to explode you for going out of the water. Now, listen, this is actually based on a story. Where is this clip? Uh, li- listen to this. This is Bill de Blasio talking about swimmers in New York City. In terms of enforcement, uh, NYPD will be out. Parks Department will be out. Obviously, first and foremost, to uh, Help make everyone remember, don't go in the water. You're not supposed to go in the water. It's a dangerous situation to ever go in the water when there's not lifeguards present. So there'll be a constant reminder of that. If anyone tries to get in the water, they'll be taken right out of the water. So we want to keep people moving. We want to make sure nothing gets too crowded. Don't want to see the boardwalks crowded. Just classic social distancing. I guess I shouldn't say classic because it's something we've only dealt with for a few months, but it, it feels like it's been a long time. We understand the basic concept of social distancing and crowding, and the NYPD will always work to avoid crowds and gatherings. So they'll be out, and parks enforcement will be out. They will pull you out of the water if you're caught swimming. Here from the Babylon Bee, that was actually Bill de Blasio. It's serious. The police will pull you out of the water in New York if you're caught swimming. But here, here from from uh, the Babylon Bee, to make sure as many people stay alive as possible, we're going to explode you for going out of the water, de Blasio said as he unveiled the official New York minefield. You go out in the water, boom. You step on the beach, yep, more mines, boom. And if the mines don't get you, the heavy machine guns will. This Atlantic wall will keep New Yorkers safe for years to come. (laughs) Well done. When we come back, Byron York is going to join me from the Washington Examiner. It is the Eric Erickson Show, and the phone number is 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Joining me from Washington, D.C. is, well, a longtime political reporter. You see him on TV. He's at the Washington Examiner. Uh, for years was at National Review, someone you got to read every day. That would be Byron York. Welcome to the program. How are you? Hey, Eric. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. So I, I read your email yesterday in your daily memo that's come out now at the Washington Examiner, and I was glad to see you writing about this. I, I was actually surprised that Ben Smith at the New York Times, of all people, would write about uh, resistance journalism and uh, Ronan Farrow. And it, it seems so much this has become a pattern in the media in Washington and New York where uh, you write stories, uh, there are kernels of truth, and then when you issue the correction three weeks later, it gets not even a quarter of the attention as the original piece that turned out not to be true. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, it was an interesting piece in the sense that it was attacking Roman Farrow, who is a particular sort of icon, sacred cow, whatever, in New York journalism circles, about some of the reporting that he's done uh, on the Me Too movement. Uh, particularly, uh, he also did a story about Michael Cohen, who is the president's lawyer now in jail, um, that just doesn't hold up at all. But resistance journalism is way bigger than anything Roman Farrow uh, has done. Uh, it is a mindset that we've had since 2017 um, that if you, if you pick the right target, if the person you're writing about is deeply unpopular in your media circles, you can virtually say anything. Um, and, it, you know, it, and if it turns out to be wrong, you don't suffer – great consequences, you might, in fact, win a big award. Um, I saw somebody yesterday say, well, maybe this is the beginning of the end for resistance journalism. I don't think so. I think as far <laughs> uh, until the, the current president, as long as the current president is still in office, I think it will still be the way to acclaim and awards and money. Well, you mentioned this, and, and you and I have both paid attention to, to journalists for years, and there's clearly always been a left-leaning bias. But it seems like now it, it's not just a left-leaning bias, but those reporters in the mainstream media who either might have sympathies with the right or don't lean far enough left are often shamed or punished. You see, for example, Catherine Heritage leaving uh, Fox for CBS, and suddenly it's it's the media, it's, it's fair game to pile on her. The attacks on Catherine Herridge, who's a great reporter, were as predictable as the sun coming up. Right. They, they were utterly predictable. And what she, what she did was at Fox, uh, her beat was national security 
She had done a lot of uh, reporting on the investigation into the investigation with the whole Trump Russia thing with Michael Flynn with the dossier, all that sort of stuff. And she continues to do that um, at CBS. And remember, we got some really big stuff recently in the Michael Flynn trial. Remember those uh, uh, when uh, obviously when the uh, uh, the uh, government dropped the charges, we got mm-hmm. these notes from the FBI that they were gaming out the Flynn interview that, you know, before they're doing it. And they say, well, should our goal be to get him to lie or should our goal be to get him fired? I mean, that is serious stuff. And Catherine reported on that. And you looked at it and you knew she would be attacked soon. And indeed she is. It, it has nothing to do with what she's uh, reported, uh, has all to do with politics and Trump. And a number of people at CBS, by the way, have defended her because it's good reporting. Yeah, it is. And it's it's unfortunate to see, you know, it's almost like a poisoning. And I realize one of the benefits of social media, particularly Twitter, is we can finally see that so many of the reporters we long suspected had uh, left wing worldviews really do. Uh, but also at the same time, it's it's been increasingly disturbing to me that the media is not only more and more lacking in self-reflection these days as they demand Republicans uh, over, go over and above with self-reflection, but also that they refuse to – it takes a lot more time for – conservatives to make their case to the media than than for the left. I, I've mentioned on this program before when I was at CNN, uh, I never, ever was asked to talk about a story that originated from the Washington Examiner or from National Review or anywhere else. It was all but from Daily Coast, from Talking Points, Memos, you name it. Uh, oftentimes the stories were were originated there. It's like they never even had the intellectual curiosity to figure out what people on the right thought. Well, Look, they're just biased. I mean, that's just all there is to it. Now, look, conservatives have been talking about that for a long time. They talked about during Reagan. They talked about during the Clinton years, Bush, Obama. I mean, they they talked about it for a long, long time. I do think there is an extra phenomenon here uh, with Trump in the sense that many on the left and many journalists feel this is a moral issue, that the president is a uh, moral disaster and he's he's a, a bigot and a xenophobe, and 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 being such a moral disaster uh, justifies more aggressive tactics in opposing him, and so that um, so look, um, stronger measures are required to deal with this president, and that's what we're seeing. So it's it's not just old. Uh, Run of the mill, the kind of bias that the Media Research Center would point out all the time, very usefully back in the back in the day. It's something different. It is kind of a moral crusade against this president. Well, and it, that's a perfect transition into your email today about the the FBI and the Mike Flynn information, the revelations, uh, because yeah. it, it's almost as if the media treats Flynn as the enemy because he worked for the president, as as we've seen the media do, even trying to get Fauci fired and others trying to gin up controversy there. Uh, and it, it makes you wonder, what are they leaving out in the story that Republicans are trying to get attention to and can't? Yeah, this is a new newsletter I'm doing called The Daily Memo, which you can go to WashingtonExaminer.com and uh, and sign up for the, the 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 story today is Republicans on the House. Now they're the minority; they can't really get anything done. Uh, they want to know this. This is what we were just talking about. Remember the notes from the FBI before the Flynn interview? Should we try to get him fired? Should we um, catch him in a lie? What sh- what should we do? Um, they want to know more about those and have uh, invited the two. Uh, people involved, uh, the, the former FBI supervisor, Bill Priestap, and the agent, Joe Pienka, uh, to come ask, answer questions before the House Judiciary Committee. Now, they're the minority. Chairman Nadler does not want this, okay? It's not going to happen unless unless one of these two just agrees to do it, and they're, they're, they're hoping that one of them will agree to do it. This is the plight of the minority. I mean, it happens. It's, it's right. just the way it goes. The party that won – controls the House completely, um, and, the re- <laughs> and the Republicans are not the party that won. Uh, right. But it is good to be on the record trying to get this information, and you never know. Sometimes you find things out. 
Well, and for those of you just tuning in, I'm, I'm talking to Byron York from the Washington Examiner. He's got a new daily memo that comes out by email. And to make it easy for you, if you use my, my the keyword I always give you guys, data, text it to 33777. I'll text you back a link. Uh, you can click the link. It goes straight to the subscription page for the email if you want to get it. Byron, you, you, towards the end of your your uh, memo today, you mentioned the Durham investigation, and maybe these guys can wait to see what happens there. What's your take on the Durham investigation? <laughs> Well, I think it was interesting when we saw the attorney general say, look, you know, if you're thinking that Barack Obama or Joe Biden are going to get indicted here, you know, forget about it. And I think it's been a bad trend on the right as well as the left, but in the right in this case of wanting to see people hang for various offenses when what we really need to find out is what happened in the uh, Obama administration during the transition, uh, what sort of spying was done on the Trump campaign. Um, the use the use of dossiers and and and, and um, wiretap warrants and all that kind of stuff. So that's what we need to find out. Now Durham uh, is supposedly going way beyond uh, what Michael Horowitz, who was the Justice Department Inspector General, could do. Remember, Horowitz was limited to talking to people from the Justice Department. Uh, right. Durham is not so limited at all, and a lot of um, a lot of Republicans feel that the intelligence agencies, not in the Justice Department, were part of all this. Um, the the interesting question is, uh, remember, in the old world of prosecutors, if you investigate somebody and you don't indict them, you don't do a report. You may say, I finished the investigation, we've taken no action, and that's it. Well, mm-hmm. Robert Mueller could have done that, but he didn't do that. He published a 400-page report, and by golly, Republicans want a 400-page report from Durham uh, telling – what he found. So I, I think that we will, this is, we will get such a report because this is just how it's done now. Um, but I frankly don't know what it's going to, what it's going to say. Time right. is ticking away. I mean, yeah. it is already mid to late May. Uh, there's an election in November. Uh, if President Trump loses, uh, there's no way there'll be any investigations like this in a Democratic administration. So uh, Durham needs to get going. <laughs> One of the, the things that, that I've been concerned about in, in the last number of years, you saw it on the right with Obamacare, you see it on the in the left with Mueller, and now almost back to the right with Durham, is this quest for the silver bullet, just this, this one thing to take out the other side. Yeah. And there seems to be a lot of emotional investment in this stuff and inevitable disappointment every time it doesn't pan out. Well, yeah. Well, a relative of the sur- um, silver bullet is the smoking gun. Yeah. And uh, Remember, in the search for collusion, there was there, this smoking gun or that smoking gun. It was the Trump Tower meeting. That proves it. Or Paul Manafort showed polls to somebody. That proves the smoking gun. Um, it just doesn't happen that way. It's a very, very complex, uh, complex thing. But we need to find out what the intelligence services, law enforcement services, were doing targeting the Trump campaign. We, we, you know, we have tantalizing bits of that. We've got a you know, we, when we saw news that that this was discussed, that President Obama in a uh, January fifth, twenty seventeen meeting knew about the uh, Michael Flynn wiretaps. So you think, well, what else did he know about? Was he kept apprised of this? Did he direct it? Uh, you know, what's going on? This is the heart of what's called Obamagate right now. Um, but it's just it's just a desire to know what happened in this critical time because. It turned into an investigation, an uproar, a special counsel that consumed three years of a four-year president. Mm -hmm. It's it's not nothing. It's really important, and we need to know what happened. So before you get out of here, uh, and feel free to completely disagree with me on this, but this this has been my prevailing theory about how we got to this point, is that uh, the Obama team – they wanted to believe every bad thing about Trump and his team. And as, as the Steele dossier and stuff started circulating, it began to reinforce their their presuppositions that Trump was bad and that the Russians were involved. And so moving forward, every decision that was made along the way was made from the standpoint of this guy is bad and in bed with the Russians. And the presupposition is we, we hate him and, and he must be stopped. And, and that led us to the point of them not even being able to conceive of the idea that Hillary was just a bad candidate. It had to be the Russians. Yeah, um, I, I think that's absolutely right. I would add to that a, a, a sense of deep offense 
that the new administration was going to come in and, believe it, believe it or not, change the policies yeah. of President Obama. And so when it was clear, for example, that Michael Flynn talked to the Russian ambassador, and his, his message to the ambassador, as far as we can tell, was, uh, the, you got these new sanctions. Don't don't escalate it. You know, uh, uh, respond. Uh, you know, in, in in proportion, if you must, that's fine. But but we'll talk about it later when we're in office. That's in, that's what new administrations always do. But it involved changing the pre- the policies of President Obama. I think they were deeply offended by that. <laughs> and yeah. uh, you you mix that uh, with the suspicion and what you were talking about this this view of Trump then you get what what they did. (laughs) And the rest is history. All right, uh, Byron York, your new daily memo, uh, if folks want to get it. uh, Now, is it it five days a week or seven days a week? It is uh, five days a week. And, you know, you know, these uh, these newsletters that say it's like a little one page digest of everything you need to know. This is not that this is I I look at stories that I think are most interesting and that are not getting enough attention. Uh, Uh And hopefully if you look at it, uh, you will find out something that you did not know before. Well, and, and you know, I, I appreciate that. I, I like the, the the highlights, the the headlines and the bullets. It, it's something that someone can actually sit down and read to start their day and, and get a little more information on it. I, I like the way you're doing it. Uh, if you guys want to subscribe to it, you can go to the WashingtonExaminer.com or real easy, if you just text the word data to 33777, I will send you right back a direct link to the subscription page for Byron's newsletter. Uh, and Byron, thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate it very much. It's always good to talk to you. Thank you, Eric. Enjoyed it. Absolutely. Byron York. And again, if you text the word data to 33777, uh, I'll send you back the Department of Public Health link and the IHME model link. But uh, the third link will be to Byron's uh, daily newsletter. You can subscribe to it. uh, And there is no charge for his daily newsletter. It is free. And it is nice that it's not a a compendium of all the news you need to know. It, It is one topic, like, for example, yesterday's was the uh, the Ben Smith story on Ronan Farrow and particularly how uh, Ronan Farrow reported a bunch of stuff on Michael Cohen and it turns out none of it can be substantiated. Two years later, none of it can actually be substantiated. And then today on the uh, situation on Capitol Hill with Mike Flynn. So text data to 33777. You can subscribe five days a week. It is completely free at the Washington Examiner with Byron York. And thanks to him for joining us this morning. There are so many things to text. I like using this texting app. You know, I I decided uh, several years ago when I set out uh, and decided I wanted to do my own radio show uh, that this is one of the things I would do is is to make it easy on people uh, to give you the the information. Because so often uh, I get emails from people, hey, you're talking about this, that or the other. Uh, where are you getting it from? And just being able to to say, you know, if if you text show to three three seven seven seven, you can get the daily show notes. You can get the podcast. Uh, if you text recipe, I'll send recipes. And by the way, they are going to start back this week. Uh, they are logged and and will soon be ready to go. I, I redid my brisket recipe, brisket sauce. Uh, it is my my barbecue sauce recipe. I love it. Uh, you don't need barbecue sauce if you do good barbecue. And I did a fantastic Boston butt on my rec tech, uh, but I make the sauce anyway. Uh, and uh, then you can do, well, if you do data to 33777, you get the Department of Public Health numbers and you get the IHME model numbers and you'll get a link to Byron York's email. You can just click it and subscribe. It is no charge, Byron's email. Uh, he's been around for a while. It's kind of cool to talk to these guys who I kind of grew up paying attention to, and and now they come on my show and talk to me. Data to 33777. There is news. There is very good news in the state of Georgia right now. Uh, I don't know that it's embargoed. I was told it it, it isn't going to hit the wires for a little while. Can I Can I tell you? Can you can I tell you in advance because it hasn't hit the news service yet? In fact, let me make sure. Let me make sure. I see. I I don't know. I I may get in trouble for letting y'all in on the secret, but it's really good news. And I, I, I think it's news that you need to know. Let's see. No, 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 no. It's no. Hadn't hit the wires yet. I. Should I tell you guys? I I'm thinking I can tell you because it's it's gonna hit the news. I might as well break the news. There's breaking news. This is this is big breaking news. For the first time since the beginning of April, 
hospitalizations in Georgia are below 1,000 for the virus. That's remarkable. Uh, Since the beginning of April, we've had at least 1,000 people in hospital care for COVID-19 in Georgia until today. We're now below it. That is good news. Uh, and we should all be happy with that news. We should all be happy uh, with the progress in the state. And you know, this gets back into what I was talking about earlier, that uh, you've got people who don't want to accept the good news now. Now, there there are those who don't want to accept the good news because uh, things have been so bad, they don't want to get disappointed if the bottom falls out. And, you know, I, I do think, in fact, let me read you my, my daily. So if you text data to 33777, you're going to get back to the Department of Public Health link, the, the IMHME and the, and the Byron York thing, and you're going to get a, another text message later. And it's going to say, hey, I've got this daily newsletter. You know, I, I pay for the texting service out of pocket. Uh, I, I I do all this stuff. Uh, we don't have advertisers subsidizing it. And one of the, the great ways to help me is to subscribe. It's just seven bucks to subscribe to the email that I send out. Whether you do or you do not, I try to make a, a portion of it freely available to everyone. And let me read you how I started it today. I suspect, this is me writing this morning, I suspect we may see a viral rebound in the United States that pushes some to aggressively go back into a lockdown. I don't know that the United States will, but I also think so much media rage reporting has happened about Trump and the virus that the media has largely failed to note just how similar other countries have performed to the United States. This suggests it is not Trump, but the virus. Unfortunately, the media is in permanently is permanently in blame Trump mode. Certainly there are legitimate criticisms. Silly me just thinks when the entire planetary governmental systems behave similarly that it's not the president of the United States but some external factor like a microscopic entity. Likewise, other countries are seeing viral rebounds and contemplating new lockdowns, so I expect that here too. I do. I I, I expect We will see a governmental lockdown uh, or at least an attempt because I think we'll see a a potential viral rebound. I hope not. I I really hope not. But if every other country on the planet is starting to see it, how are we going to be an exception? But that should not mean we avoid the good news. And the good news is that we have seen a trend line in the right direction. We have seen a decline in the spread, and we are now below a 1,000 people in the hospital with COVID-19 in Georgia, and we should be applauding that news. Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here across the state of Georgia, and I say that intentionally because as much as I have global ambitions for this here media radio empire, uh, we're right now a Georgia show, and, and we got to get into some Georgia news here. Uh, particularly, I'm getting so many questions about the ballot. Uh, there are things we need to discuss, uh, but I'll take your phone calls as well. 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Uh, this hour of the program is uh, yet again sponsored by First Liberty Building and Loan in Noonan, Georgia. They can help you nationwide, by the way. It uh, doesn't matter where you are listening. Uh, anywhere in the United States of America, First Liberty Building and Loan can help you. Uh, they've been helping small businesses and mid-sized businesses uh, nationally since 1993. And right now they can help you get into the payroll protection program. They cannot guarantee it, uh, but they will do their best to get you in. Uh, go to firstlibertyga.com. That's their website. And click on the Apply Now button at firstlibertyga.com. Apply now. Uh, fill out the form. Get your payroll paperwork in order, and they'll help you get into the program. No guarantees, but they've been having good success getting businesses in. If your business needs it, let them know. I want to spend a few moments uh, talking about the ballots for the election. And you should know I, I'm prepared to tell you to to vote uh, in a couple of races. Um, in the 9th Congressional District, if I lived in the 9th Congressional District, I would be voting for Matt Gertler uh, for Congress. If I lived in the 7th, I would be voting for Rich McCormick. If I lived in the 6th, I would be voting for Karen Handel. 
And if I lived in the 14th, I would vote between Marjorie Green and, and Kevin Cook. Kevin Cook uh, is one of the – Marjorie Green doesn't have a, a legislative record, and Kevin Cook does. And Kevin Cook's record is is the type of conservative record where you know he's going to stand up to his own side. He's one of those. He and Gertler both are on the resolution calling for the ouster of Speaker Ralston, which is the speaker is out to get them. Uh, it looks like there's going to be a runoff up in the 14th. If you want to make sure uh, that you're in a solid runoff with solid people, you want to vote for Kevin Cook or Marjorie Green up there uh, and get the two most conservative candidates in that runoff, the, the polling up there shows it's going to be a runoff. Um, and Michael Caldwell is running for the state Senate against incumbent Brandon Beach. And Brandon's fine, but Michael Caldwell is hands down more conservative. We can improve that seat by getting Michael Caldwell in there. Uh, so I would vote for him. And if you're in the Noonan Peachtree City area, Philip Singleton uh, is the incumbent. And the Speaker of the House hates his guts and is out to get him. And I would vote for Philip Singleton. And if you're in North Georgia in the Dalton area, Chuck Payne has a challenger in the primary vote for Chuck Payne. You absolutely, absolutely want to vote for Chuck Payne. Uh, the, the, the left is out to get Chuck Payne. You want to support Chuck Payne. Uh, make sure you keep him in office. Now, when you get your ballot, if you're a Republican, I'm looking at, at my sample ballot. Uh, you're going to have some local races, but let, let's, let's walk through the ballot right now. And I'm going to do the Democrat and the Republican both. Uh, I'm going to start with the Republican, and you don't have a lot of races. You've got president. You just got Trump. You got Purdue for Senate, uh, Jason Shaw for Public Service Commission uh, for one seat, and and Bubba McDonald Jr. for another. And then you're going to have your congressman. Mine is Austin Scott. Uh, there's Danny Ellison and Vance Dean. I'll I'll vote for Austin Scott in that race. And then I've got state Senate. Uh, there's no challenger to John Kennedy in the primary and state House. There's no challenger to Dale Washburn in the House. Uh, for sheriff, I don't know who this Ricketson person is, uh, but he doesn't have a challenger. And then you've got, you will have party questions before you get to any of your local and county races. Uh, well, actually, I take that back. Uh, you'll have, if you're, you may have district attorney, you may have countywide races. So the way it works on the ballot is your, you've got all of your state, county, and city partisan races. And then you have in your partisan primary ballot, you've got your partisan primary questions, and then you've got all the nonpartisan races, starting with judge and working your way down to like school board and, and mayor. Um, so when you get through all of the partisan races, each party gets to ask questions. Here are the Republican Party questions for the ballot. Should Georgia lawmakers expand educational options by allowing a student state education dollars to follow to the school that best fits their needs, whether that is public, private, magnet, charter, virtual, or homeschool, yes or no? Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, yes, you want to so, show overwhelming support for school choice in Georgia uh, because why the Republicans in the legislature led by the speaker have been blocking school choice, you want to show overwhelming Republican support for that. Number two, should voting in the Republican primary be limited to voters that are registered as Republicans? Yes, uh, you should have closed primaries. Republicans should only be the ones allowed to vote for Republicans, Democrats for Democrats. Uh, and should candidates for a board of education be required to declare their political party? I don't see a reason why. Um, why? No. No, I, I'm opposed to partisan boards of election. Uh, educating your child should not be partisan. Uh, now, that leads me into the nonpartisan races, and I want to get there. But first, let's deal with the partisan races on the Democratic ballot. Uh, the Democrats will also have a, a ballot, uh, and I, I'm going to use mine. The first race will be for president, and you'll go in thinking there's just going to be Biden and Sanders. There's not. Let me read you the names. Michael Bennett, Joseph Biden, Michael Bloomberg, Pete Buttigieg, John Delaney, Tulsi Gabbard, Amy Klobuchar, Deval Patrick, Bernie Sanders, Tom Steyer, Elizabeth Warren, and Andrew Yang. They will all be on the ballot. And then you'll have your Senate race for the Democrats. Sarah Riggs Amico, Markeith DeJesus, uh, James Knox, Tricia Carpenter McCracken, John Ossoff, Maya Dillard Smith, and Teresa Pike Tomlinson. They'll be your Senate candidates. You'll have for Public Service Commissioner, uh, Robert Bryant will be a candidate. You'll have another race uh, where you'll be able to choose between Daniel Blackman and John Knoll to challenge Lauren Bubba McDonald. You'll then have your congressional races. And then you will have uh, your 
um, state house and state senate races, and then you will have your county partisan races, district attorney, clerk of court, sheriff, tax commissioner, solicitor, all those sorts of things. Then you will get into the Democratic Party question. Now, listen to these. These are what the Democratic Party wants you polled on. Should Georgians work to stop climate change and listen to the scientific community, which recommends immediate action to combat the serious threat to our planet? That's question one. Question two, should Georgia enact basic standards to protect our environment for wa- from wasteful plastic items that pollute our state? Question three, should every eligible Georgian be allowed to register to vote on election day to make sure everyone can exercise the right to vote? Question four, should Georgia take partisanship out of the redistricting process and have an independent commission draw district lines instead of politicians? Question five, should our criminal justice system end the discriminatory cash bailout system that allows the wealthy to buy their way out of jail while disadvantaged lower income Georgia with, uh, wait, what? This question screwed up. Should our, I'm reading it word for word on the ballot. Should our criminal justice system end the discriminatory cash bail system that allows the wealthy to buy their way out of jail while disadvantaging, oh, I see, I I misread, disadvantaging lower-income Georgians. Okay. And then question six, should every Georgian that has served their sentence for a crime they committed be allowed to have their voting rights restored? Now, the Democrats always ask more questions, and just so you understand about these, because I've gotten these questions about why, why are these questions, what are these questions, are we amending the Constitution? No. Uh, these are primary questions. Each party is allowed to put questions on their primary party's ballot. Uh, they have to help pay for the cost, and uh, they always ask questions catering to their crowd. They typically come from their conventions, they're passed by resolution, and they're put on the ballot. The Democrats always ask more, and they're always about stuff like this, environmental nonsense and whatnot. Now, once you get past all the partisan stuff, you get to the nonpartisan stuff. Uh, Big question is uh, the nonpartisan general election for Supreme Court justice. Uh, Beth Beskin or Charlie Bethel? Uh, Charlie Bethel is the incumbent, and you want to vote for Charlie Bethel. Uh, listen, uh, Beth Beskin is is a very nice person, uh, but Charlie Bethel has done nothing wrong as the incumbent. He's also more pro-life than Beskin. Uh, so you want to vote for Charlie Bethel. You want to make sure you support the incumbents in these uh, Supreme Court races. These are Brian Kemp picks, among others. They deserve to be supported. Sarah Hawkins Warren, uh, as well, for the Supreme Court. You want to vote for her. Uh, And then you will have court of appeals races. You will have uh, your superior court races and the like. Just vote for the incumbents, folks. Just vote for the incumbents, and you will not go wrong supporting the incumbents. Uh, And then in some places, you will have votes for coroner, for county, nonpartisan races for boards of education and for mayor and and the like. Gosh, I, I got to tell you, I, I'm so I'm living in Macon, and we've got a we got a five person mayoral primary, and I I don't know. I guess I'm going. I don't know this Blake Sullivan guy, but I, I like Larry Schlesinger. I'm going to vote for Larry Schlesinger, Blake Sullivan. Uh, I'm not really excited about any of the other candidates, but that's just for me locally where I am. Um, I like Larry. Um, but I don't know that Larry, I, I don't he campaign. There hasn't been so much you can campaign. So I don't know, but nonetheless, um, it'll be Blake Sullivan or Larry Schlesinger for me. Um, that's the ballot. The big races though, the partisan races are going to be your Senate race. If you're a Democrat and some state legislative races. And if you're Republican, the ninth congressional district, that's uh North East Georgia. The 14th Congressional District, that is Northwest Georgia, and the 7th Congressional District, that is northwest of downtown Atlanta, the, or northeast, rather, the Gwinnett County area, and it stretches north up towards Gainesville, uh, close there, not not quite to Gainesville, not quite to Hall County. Uh, that's uh, And I'm supporting Rich McCormick. Uh, Renee Unterman is in that race, and she'd be fine. Uh, I think Rich McCormick will wind up being a more reliable conservative. Ted Cruz and Mike Lee and a number of others have come out for Rich McCormick. Uh, I think he would be great. That race, by the way, is going to be a one the Democrats want to pick up and one the Democrats could pick up. Uh, so you need your best candidate forward in that race. And in the 6th Congressional District, uh, Karen Handel wants to challenge Lucy McBath. McBath got the seat from Karen Handel. 
two years ago. Karen Handel is back again to, to try to challenge and take back the seat. Um, and, but it's going to be a it, it's going to be a messy, messy race um, in the statewide level, though. Uh, absolutely. You want to vote for uh, you want to vote for. If you live up in north of Atlanta in the Cherokee County um, and North Atlanta area, you want to vote for Michael Caldwell for the state Senate. Just hands down. If you're in the Noonan Peachtree City area, you hands down, you want to vote for the um, for Philip Singleton. And uh, if you live in the Paulding County area and you head out towards West Georgia there, uh, you want to vote for Jason Anavatarte. Um, you absolutely want to support him. Uh, he is a solid, solid candidate. Th- those are my picks right now. Uh, I may add to them. I'll put them somewhere and let you know. But uh, one big thing is for the nonpartisan sup- Supreme Court races, vote for the incumbents. They really are good conservatives, uh, more conservative than those who are challenging them. So I highly recommend that you do that. Now, to the phones, John calling from McDonough. You're going to be next on the program. Welcome. Hey, uh, hey, Eric, how's it going? Um, Good, how are you? Had a, had a, I'm doing well, doing well. Had a thought. I was watching TV the other night and uh, on uh, the radical Fox News, and they had uh, – um, actually, it was Fox Business I was watching, and Lou Dobbs was talking about we've got to prosecute Obama, we've got to prosecute Biden for their obvious Watergate, Nixon-esque uh, escapades that they have participated in. Um, but I think that that's only going to make them martyrs. And uh, that would rally the Democratic side. I would much prefer that everyone under them be aggressively judiciously prosecuted, so much so as to make examples of them, much like they tried to make examples of uh, Roger Stone and Carter Page, uh, because that would definitely lend a lesson to the Democratic Party that if you're going to play dirty, um, then you're going to pay for it. And uh, I'd much rather see all those underlings um, – brought to justice because that way uh, it'll be harder for the Democratic Party to rally any future underlings to perform such nefarious deeds. I mean, after after Holtman, Ehrlichman, uh, Mitchell, and Dean went to jail, uh, they let Nixon go. Um, The Democratic, uh, excuse me, the Republican Party was uh, um, scourged. And uh, I'd like to see a scourging of the Democratic Party over this Obama gate. <laughs> Listen, uh, I, you are absolutely right on Obama and Biden. The, the issue with Obama and Biden is you go after them. Uh, you do absolutely make them e- even you amplify them, make them bigger heroes. You incentivize people. Uh, the locker up chant isn't going to work with them. Uh, the Democrats will turn people out. And frankly, it, it is rather third world kleptocracy to go after the former leaders. It, it is, whether you, you want to admit it or not. Uh, this is what third world governments do. And if the Trump administration does it to Biden and Obama, you can be one billion percent sure that the moment they are no longer in office, the Democrats are going to go after them. And it just becomes a tit for tat that totally undermines uh, the foundations of the republic to, to go after the prior leader. Uh, you go after you, – you do an investigation and you see what did wrong. But here's the thing. you got to actually do a real investigation, and, and that's what Durham is doing. And there may be no criminal charges. He may find nothing wrong, and that will never placate Republicans. But you go down this road of investigation and counter-investigation of the prior administrations. Uh, what we really need to do is try to find the truth. Uh, if we make it about just uh, grievances and scoring points and, and settling things – then you're going to see it spiral out of control. Let's just find the truth of what they did because clearly there were people, absolutely, and maybe some of them do need to go to jail. There were people who overstepped their bounds because they hated Donald Trump so much they wanted to stop him, and they sacrificed any objectivity they might have had to believe the worst about the incoming president to try to stop him. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. <laughs> My neighbor just sent me this. We, we're, we're planning on, uh, for the 4th of July, going to Hilton Head and the headline in the island packet, Hilton Head Beach cleared Monday afternoon for large shark in the water. Uh, yay. Uh, see, I want to take my drone and fly it out and, and check this stuff out. I, ooh, wow. They're actually, ooh. Wow, that is a big picture. My goodness gracious. You know, so when I was a kid uh, living in, in Louisiana, we would go down, before we moved to Dubai, we would go down to Grand Isle, Louisiana. It's one of the, the first memories of the beach I have. Man, I remember getting so terribly sunburned down there one time. 
and but there would be porpoises in the water and i would just be convinced convinced that they were sharks you would see the fins coming out of the water and i would be freaked out man i hated to go in the water uh and, and of course everybody else knew that there were porpoises because they had uh flat tails um parallel to the water and but man i was i was just convinced uh, yeah, so, you know, if the tail, if you see the fin coming out of the water and the tail is, is up and down as opposed to across, uh, you're dealing with a shark. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I didn't know. Now, nowadays, I, I like to, to go to the beach. Uh, one day I'd love to have a house in Hilton Head and, and just be able to sit there and, and watch the, the dolphins from the balcony, watch the dolphins in the water. I, I love it. But, yeah, I'll stay out of the water if there are sharks. But I'm going. By God, am I going. Yeah, I, I need the break. Um I may actually take off this Friday just because it's it's finally time. I, I don't think I've taken off since February other than I was sick last Monday. Uh, y'all wouldn't have wanted me here last Monday, uh, but nonetheless, okay, I, I digress. Uh, we got to move on to other things. Uh, there is actually some more good news out there that you, you need to know about. Uh, you, have you heard all of the stories about people getting reinfected? There have been people who tested positive again for uh, after they've recovered and they've tested positive. You've heard the story. It's happened in Korea, South Korea. It's happened in Taiwan. It's had Taiwan, not Taiwan. Taiwan has happened in Japan. It's happened now in the United States. There are people who they fully recover and then they get tested a second time and they test positive. And there has been a big debate in the scientific community as to whether or not people are getting reinfected and can you get reinfected. It's actually one of the unknown things about the virus. Can you get reinfected? Well, there is a new study out that uh, the patients who are testing positive and presumed reinfected are not actually reinfected. Uh, they are, uh, the virus is, the, the the test is detecting the dead virus that their body continues to shed. Researchers are finding evidence that patients who test positive for the coronavirus after recovering aren't capable of transmitting the infection and could have the antibodies that prevent them from falling sick again. Scientists from the Korean Centers for Disease Control and Prevention studied 285 COVID-19 survivors who had tested positive for the coronavirus after their illness had resolved, as indicated by previous negative results. The so-called repositive patients weren't found to have spread any lingering infection, and virus samples collected from them couldn't be grown in culture, indicating the patients were shedding non-infectious or dead virus particles. The findings are a positive sign for regions looking to open up as more patients recover from the pandemic. Uh, So that is more good news to add to the body of good news, including the latest good news from Georgia, that hospitalizations have fallen below 1,000 for the first time since the beginning of April. Good news all around right now on this. You can call in. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. And keep in mind that if you want Byron York's newsletter or you want to see the daily totals for uh, the, the coronavirus spread in Georgia, text the word DATA to 33777. I'll get you back that. Let me give you that update right now. Uh, 38,624 confirmed cases, but that's cumulative, not current. There are only a couple thousand current cases in Georgia, which is really good. Uh, There are 7,002 cumulative hospitalizations in Georgia, but less than 1,000 current. And that's the first time since uh, the exact date is April 8th. On April 8th, the state of Georgia crossed over the 1,000 hospital bed mark. And we've been above a thousand people in hospitals in Georgia for COVID-19 since April 8th. And uh, now we're below it. And that is a good thing. And the progress continues. Uh, in fact, the governor's office reached out about me talking to him this afternoon. And, and if I talk to him, I'll be sure to bring you guys my interview with him tomorrow um, morning. Uh, but it's really good news. Really, really good news. And we should uh, be celebrating that good news now. 
Uh, there is other news out there as well that we need to get to, including, uh, you know, in the seventh congressional district, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has weighed in on Nabila Islam. Uh, once the, that, that is the best known liberal in the district and the best known liberal in the country is now jumping in, uh, because of quote unquote Islam's, uh, campaign because of her working class background. It provides her with unique insight into what Americans go through on a regular basis. That's right. Um, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez weighing in, you know, we haven't done this in a while. We, we, while she's weighing in on Nabila Islam because of her working class background, providing unique insight into what Americans go through on a regular basis, we should consider the unique insights that we get from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, her actual words. And now, Deep Thoughts by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I mean, it's true. It's like, we need to take a look at factory farming, you know? Period. It's wild. It's not like to say we're going to force everybody to go vegan or anything crazy like that. But it's to say, listen, maybe you shouldn't be eating a hamburger for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like, let's keep it real. That was Deep Thoughts. By Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. <laughs> Those were her actual words. All, all, all we did is is take the transcript of her actual words. That was Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, who has seen fit to weigh in on a race here in Georgia, uh, the seventh congressional district. Uh, that you know, a lot of Democrats, a lot of people think could potentially go to the Democrats in November and. You know, the polling right now is very favorable to the Democrats, but it's all a reaction to the virus. It, it's not that the polling is wrong. It's just that the polling is right now. It's it's not polling in the future. We're not getting a sense of where the race may be. Uh, there's no reason to panic about it. There there actually is a a a real um there there's a, a real divide in the country that is well, it's not going away, and it's reflected in the polling, and there's a real angst in the polling. There's a real angst in the uh, country right now over the direction of the country because there's worry about the virus. And, and there, as I mentioned before, there are so many people who don't want to take advantage of the good news because they're so worried about more bad news coming, and I understand that, but you can only take that so far. Well, I, I, I need to move on to something away from the virus because – uh, do you know what gaslighting is? Hang on a second. Let me, um, let me, where, where, here it is. Um, I, I need to read the Wikipedia entry for you. Gaslighting is a form of psychological manipulation in which a person or group covertly sows seeds of doubt in a targeted individual, making them question their own memory, perception, or judgment often evoking in them cognitive dissonance and other changes such as low self-esteem. Using denial, misdirection, contradiction, and misinformation, gaslighting involves attempts to destabilize the victim and delegitimize the victim's beliefs. Instances can range from the denial by an abuser that previous abusive incidents occurred to the staggering or bizarre events by the accuser with the intention of disorienting the victim. The term originated from the British play Gaslight uh, in 1938, but performed as Angel Street in the United States. It was adapted into films in 1940 and 1944, both called Gaslight. The term has been used in clinical psychological literature as well as in political commentary. Uh, in the play uh, Gaslight, the husband attempts to convince his wife and others that the wife is insane by manipulating small elements of their environment and insisting she is mistaken, remembering things incorrectly or delusional when she points out these changes. The play's title alludes to how the abusive husband slowly dims the gas lights in their home while pretending nothing has changed. 
in an effort to make his wife doubt her own perceptions. He further uses the lights in the sealed-off attic to secretly search for jewels belonging to a woman who he has murdered. He makes loud sounds as he searches, including talking to himself. The wife repeatedly asks her husband to confirm her perceptions about the dimming lights, noises, and voices, but in defiance of reality, he keeps insisting the lights are the same and instead that she is going insane. He intends on having her assessed and committed to a mental institution, after which he will be able to gain power of attorney over her and search more effectively. Gaslighting. We are being gaslit by the Democrats and the feminists. Let me read you the headline. This is a, a uh, opinion piece at the New York Times. Believe all women is a right-wing trap. Joe Biden has been accused of sexual assault, and conservatives are having a field day, exultant that they've caught feminists in a new hypocrisy trap. A woman with no corroboration beyond contemporaneous accounts charges a powerful man with a decades-old crime. Hmm, doesn't that sound mighty close to Christine Blasey Ford's complaint against Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh, yet this time many liberals who've championed the Me Too movement seem skeptical. Gotcha. Tim Graham, executive editor of Newsbusters, where is the Me Too movement on the story? What happened to their rigid Believe All Women boilerplate? Fox News host Tucker Carlson, the infuriating, the sickening hypocrisy of the media and the professional feminist movement, Believe All Women, no they don't. White House advisor Kellyanne Conway, three magic words, Believe All Women, I didn't hear an asterisk. In fact, Believe All Women does have an asterisk. It's never been feminist boilerplate. What we are witnessing is another instance of the right decrying what it imagines the American women movement to be. Spend some mind-numbing hours tracking the origins of Believe All Women on social media sites and news databases, as I did, and you'll discover how language like a virus can mutate. All of a sudden, yesterday's quotes suffer the insertion of some foreign DNA. All... The word inserted was all the rage during the Kavanaugh hearings when senators from Kamala Harris Harris to Maisie Hirono had their regard for Dr. Blasey's credibility elevated by Fox News pundits to universal gender credulity. Their actual words, I believe her, became believe all women. That's literally the hashtag former Fox News contributor Morgan Ortega said in February 2019, there's a great search function on Twitter. You can search Believe All Women. For those of you who don't believe, that's what the Democrats had in the Kavanaugh case. Is there literally a hashtag? Well, kind of. Meaningfully tracking hashtags on Twitter is a confounding chore, even for the professional data scrapers I consulted. It's a very interesting rabbit hole, Pablo Morales Henry, digital archivist at Harvard University Schlesinger Library, which maintains a collection of more than 30 million Me Too related tweets, told me, nevertheless, let's take the challenge. As she noted, Twitter has a search function. While hardly great, does at least crudely reflect the site's use. Type in Believe All Women for 2017 when the Me Too movement took off in October, and you get several dozen references, followed in October by many more. Here's the thing. I found the hashtag is by a wide margin used mostly by distractors. Wait, 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 wait. Let me read this sentence again. I found the hashtag is by a wide margin used mostly by its detractors. So in other words, there are people on the left who use believe all women. You know, here's the thing. This is gaslighting. It was objectively true that believe all women and believe women were both things the left claimed. We saw Republicans attacked for refusing to believe women, for for claiming. We saw Hollywood celebrities say that uh, you had to believe women. You had to believe all women. You, You saw this time and time again. And now they're saying, no, not really. No, it was actually people on the right saying this. Well, of course people on the right were saying it because we were mocking the people on the left saying believe all women. You had Hollywood celebrities saying this. 
you had Hollywood celebrities leading the charge about Believe All Women. You saw it with the accusations against Weinstein. You saw it with the accusations against Matt Lauer, with Bill Cosby, with with um, with, with uh, Charlie. What's what's his name? Um, Charlie Rose. And you saw it with Brett Kavanaugh. Believe all women. And now here come the feminists say, no, actually, it was really the right using that. No, what? Well, this is gaslighting, folks. This is gaslighting. I lived through the Brett Kavanaugh controversy. I was routinely assailed on TV for defending Brett Kavanaugh and not believing Christine Blasey Ford and was told we have an obligation as a society to believe all women. I lived through this. I lived through the hate mail. I lived through the reporters sending me nasty notes that I thought you were better than this. And now here comes this feminist saying, No, we really didn't do all that. Yes, you damn well did. You did it to me on a regular basis. You did it to people I know who who on a regular basis were assailed for being misogynist, for daring not to believe all women. Not just Christine Blasey Ford. And now here you come saying, actually, no. The New York Times has already run pieces by other feminists saying, yeah, as a matter of fact, I believe all women. Uh, And even though I believe you, Tara Reid, I'm going to support Joe Biden. That's what this is all about. This is crazy gaslighting. This is ridiculous gaslighting. And the New York Times is allowing it because they've got to help Joe Biden. By the way, I I don't think there's the, the I don't think there's a there there with Tara Reid except to the extent that it undermines further undermines media credibility and it should further undermine media credibility. Uh it, it, we deserve to have the media undermined for their credibility. They did a terrible job. They genuinely did a terrible job. And the fact that so many of them are now trying to rewrite history from just two years ago that every single person who's been alive and an adult paid attention to and knew, unless you were Joe Biden, who's probably been senile for several years. The rest of us already knew this. And now they're trying to revise it. Now they're trying to say, we didn't really mean it that way, or you're putting words in our mouth. We're not putting words in your mouth. You said it. You believed it until it became inconvenient because it was a woman going after a Democrat. And so now they have to gaslight us. They've been accusing Donald Trump of gaslighting people for three years. And now they're doing it. They are no better than what they claim him to be. Again, how did I start this program? It is Donald Trump's unique superpower to make other people behave in the way they claim he behaves. You think Donald Trump gaslights people? Well, by God, you're going to. You think Donald Trump is a misogynist? Well, by God, you're going to be one. You think Donald Trump abuses other people? Well, you are. You think Donald Trump is a serial liar? Then you probably are too. Donald Trump makes other people behave in the way they claim he behaves. It is his unique superpower. They believe that he gaslights people, and so by God, they're going to gaslight us and tell us that the last three years of American history that we lived through, the Kavanaugh hearings and the like, really didn't happen. They're willing to lie to get Joe Biden elected, and they're willing to keep you sheltered in place to wreck the economy to make sure Donald Trump loses. Man, so I I put in the Believe All Women hashtag, and yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, it is a massive number of progressives berating people for not believing all women. Uh, Funny how that works. Yep, there there absolutely, absolutely are people out there who on the right or throwing it in people's faces. But um, my goodness, um, there were a whole lot of people on the left who were using Believe All Women, who said we had to believe all women, who who adopted this hashtag. And it was people on the right who began at the end of 2018 throwing it in people's faces, throwing it in the left's face, as uh, people like Michael Avenatti were showing stunning hypocrisy when it came to the issue of believing all women, um, my goodness gracious. Um, look at that. Um, wow. Yep. All sorts of, all, all, all sorts of people on the left who 
We're adopting the believe women and believe all women and the like. And nope, nope, not anymore, not anymore. We are being gaslit. Good gracious. I, I, I gotta, I, can I give some, some commendation? I know this makes some of you mad, but, uh, the mayor of Atlanta has uh, gone on TV and said this. Mayor, I believe I remember when we were talking to you prior to the quote unquote reopening of Georgia, which as we know was very early. And let's also note there's a robust conversation going on about the quality of the numbers we're all getting out of the state of Georgia. But I think I remember you saying that uh, you hoped to be wrong, that you hoped the situation would be better than you feared. And if you were, in fact, wrong, you would say to the governor, I was wrong. Is is there a um, is it a little muddier than being able to say I was right or are I was wrong? Are we as of the time of this conversation somewhere in the middle, do you think? Um, Well, what I can say, Brian, is it's not as bad as I thought that it would be. So I am pleased about that, but I still think it's too soon to say the reason being where is initially we were seeing increases between deaths and people testing positive rising anywhere from 25 to 30 percent over a seven day period. Right now we're somewhere between 12 and 15 percent. And so it's better than it was, but it's still not great. We've still not seen that 14 day decline as recommended by the CDC. So we're not quite there where I can say um, that we are out of the woods because we are not. Because what we know is as we reopen the state, we'll also see whether or not this impacts our um, number of people who are testing positive. Listen, I, she's still nervous and I don't blame her. It has been the um, it, it's been the urban areas of the country that have been most um most affected and so I understand her concern but it's nice for her to be on television admitting that things are not nearly as bad as we thought and that's good and she should be commended for that Uh, She should be commended for being willing to say that things aren't that bad because we're seeing in some places Democrats aren't willing to do that. Uh, There are a lot of Democrats in the country right now who even as – I mean take, for example, in New York City. New York City is well over the – the curve is not only flattened. uh, The curve is is almost uh, completely on the other side. And in New York, they do not want to engage. And in New York, they do not want to reopen at all. They, I mean, they're going to round people up for trying to swim, which is crazy. And yet that's what they're going to try to do, at least in Atlanta. The mayor there is willing to say, you know what, things haven't, uh, things are not now as bad as, as we thought, not as bad as she expected them to be. She's still not comfortable. I get a lot of people aren't comfortable. I, I still think we're going to see a rebound of some kind. I do. And I don't think it's going to be Brian Kemp's fault. I think it's just people are going to let their guard down. Hopefully the summer heat will stop that. You know, the places that have managed to avoid a major rebound are the places that get hot. Uh, and, and so hopefully that'll happen here. But, man, the good news is out there. Enjoy it. Hospitalizations in Georgia, under 1,000. That's great news, folks.